Mystic in the Egyptian. We find it in the Brahmanic and Hindu mysteries of the world mountain. All of these different elements of symbolism seem to derive very closely from the study of the human body. Now in the course of this study and in the development of it, the problem of the relationship of the nervous system to the great economy of life took on uh, the greatest uh, meaning uh, to ancient man. The nervous system to the primitive people of the world seemed to be a kind of middle ground between the two great life-giving systems, the arterial and the venous blood systems. The arterial system was therefore regarded as supreme and held to be the first and greatest power of things. For well, by this system, life itself was distributed into the body. The nervous system became a kind of symbol, therefore, of the intellectual or psychic life of man. And the venous system became symbol of the mortal or physical life of man. Thus, spirit, soul, and body were represented by these systems. And of these systems, the soul or psychic body was given uh, the area of the brain because, as Buddhism later so well clarified, the entire mental life of man originates in a kind of intellectual complex. And the machinery for this complex, called the machine of the six senses, is localized or centered in the brain. It is therefore in the brain that the individual achieves self-consciousness. It is in the heart that he participates of universal consciousness. And it is through the venous system and its various functions of the body that he attains a certain body consciousness, which is comparatively uh, rudimentary, but is nevertheless present in the equations of life. In the same way, psychologically speaking, man derives an authority from these ther uh, areas of his own consciousness. Uh, from the heart center, he gains the concept or the authority of life. It is by virtue of this heart power that man is aware of the mystery of what he calls life. And he has associated life with this from the beginning. The brain he has associated with thought or the mental activity, and the venous system of the body he has associated with function or bodily structure. Man, therefore, consisting of spirit, soul, and body, or spirit, mind, and body, assigns these in a symbolic way to these three great areas of his own physical structure, which are united into one mysterious and wonderful pattern by the sovereignty of the cerebrospinal nervous system. This led in turn to a whole series of philosophical inductions and deductions, some of which are of value to us in our present thinking. Buddhism helps us in one respect because it gives us uh, to a large degree the anatomy and physiology of the nervous system. Uh, in India, it is assumed or was believed that Buddha was associated with the planet Mercury. And it is this, in turn, which primitive Western man always associated with the nervous system. The nervous system involves not only the physical sensitivity uh, to nerve action and reaction, but it involves the entire sensory existence of man. This sensory existence of man brings into focus another interesting belief of the ancients, which we have mentioned in the book, but which I would like to enlarge upon a little more. Namely, that the entire nervous system of the body is an extension of the nervous structure of the brain itself. Therefore, that there is a mental or nervous image of the whole body in the brain. And the brain process uh, is, first of all, uh, achieved within a brain body. 
and that this in turn is extended into the physical body itself. In other words, there is an archetypal man in the brain. There is an archetypal mental being in the mind itself. And man's mental life is lived in the mind, not in the body. It is only by an extension, a series of reflexes, a process of induction, that the mental life of the individual is communicated to the body itself. The instruments by means of which this communication may be achieved are the two branches of the nervous system, the cerebrospinal and the autonomic. These become the instruments for the extension of man's mental life into body. But man's mental life is essentially lived in the mind. And it is in this mental life, lived in the mind, that we have the root of practically all of the individuality factors which we consider to make up Manus, the man, the thinker. The ancients, therefore, explained that there was a microcosm of the whole physical body in the brain, that the brain was itself androgynous. The generation occurs in the process of thought just as it occurs in the process of the reproduction of bodies that the entire process of the brain function is therefore a primary uh, motion or movement of cell life and of structure by the presence of mental energy or mental archetypal pattern. Now let's try to see if we can make this just a little simpler so that we will know uh, more about what we are working with at this stage of our problem. Let us assume, for example, that consciousness per se is located in the heart. Consciousness of itself is not manifested. Consciousness is the lifeness in a thing. Consciousness, is, as its as it primary manifestation, merely produces the state of existence. This state of existence is perhaps less purely appreciated in man than in other creatures that exist. But consciousness is, in its true sense, an essence or a nature of being itself, a nature not self-knowing, not self-understanding, as we term these things, but conscious because of a factor which we say is the factor of immediate action. In other words, there is no delay or no drag in the process of the function of consciousness. Consciousness is unconditioned. It is unlimited and unrestricted. Therefore, it does not have to manifest in a conditioned way. And an unconditioned manifestation of consciousness is pure life a life in which all of the elements of conditioned existence exist, but are not present. In, in life, condition exists in its own root or essential substance or seed, but not in a conditioned state. A creature, therefore, with a heart life may be said to have a condition of consciousness similar to what Buddha describes as nirvana. It is the extinction of all particular or all attribute functioning. It is merely the state of being. A being which does not define its own nature. A being which does not affirm or deny anything. A being which merely exists and by its existence bestows life. For life is the existence of this being, which is itself immortal. In the development of life, a life uh, develops into a condition of life knowing. That which exists of its own nature cannot be known by itself. It becomes known, therefore, through aspects or extensions of itself. 
it becomes known, appreciated, or sensed because it causes to emerge from itself certain conditioned conditions of life or states of life. And in man, the primary condition by means of which life becomes capable of the knowledge of itself is man's mental focus. So the mind becomes that part of being or that part of the development of a creature in which that creature becomes aware of its own life. Primarily, therefore, it is life awareness. And this life awareness is called the first reflex of being. It is called the process by means of which being becomes a being. Being becomes self-knowing and through extension becomes capable of knowing that which is not its immediate or primary self. So consciousness in the sense of egoism Consciousness in the sense of self-consciousness arises in the mental structure. And this mental structure achieves to the state of self-consciousness by a series of experiences which are referred to in Eastern philosophy as graspings or orientations. As a person dizzy reaches out for support, to something that is strong and stable. So in its confusion, mind reaches out for supports. It attains these supports by extending itself by means of the nervous system through the sensory perceptions. And it gains certain consolation or conviction material from the testimony of these perceptions. This testimony being brought back into the mind, coordinated, by the mental coordinator and thereby assembled into various types of knowledge. All these types of knowledge having as their end and purpose the discovery or experience of the nature of a selfness or a selfhood. Thus in uh, philosophy we discover that it is by means of the mental process that man becomes capable of the consciousness of isolation. He becomes capable of thinking of himself as himself. And as a result of that, he can no longer think of himself as anything else but himself. And out of this conditioning comes the gradual separation of the personal from the universal. And the personal appears upon the surface of the universal. And the personal becomes a condition of the universal. And by means of the personal, the individual again turns his attention upon the universal, gaining this mysterious ambition to understand all mysteries, to solve all problems. Now the answer to all mysteries lies in the heart. The power to search for this answer is given by the mind, where it is the mind that discovers the mystery of the heart. It is the mind by means of which all particular things must be explored, known, or estimated. Now, out of this situation, there thus arose at a primitive time a process by means of which the mental nature began to assert itself over the arterial system. Life was conveyed to all parts of the body by the arteries. But this life was a sleeping life. A life which contained all energy, all that was necessary to enliven. But this sleeping life did not know itself or any other thing. And over this mysterious area, which had become full of life, the mental nature began to exercise control, domination, or leadership by permeating this life with a series or a mass of minute extensions which gradually became nerves. But these nerves are nothing more or less than the gradual crystallization of the seeking power of the mind. 
the mind seeking not only to know things, but to gradually coordinate the body. That the mind could control the body meant self-control. 